Hi everyone, welcome to Doing Sociology and today we have a discussion on the good university, what universities actually do and why it's time for radical change by Professor, Professor Raven Connell. She is a professor emerita at the University of Sydney and a life member of the National Territory Education Union in Australia. She has taught in several countries and is a widely cited researcher on questions of gender relations, education and social justice, as well as the global economy of knowledge. At the 2023 World Congress of Sociology held in Australia, Melbourne, she was presented with the International Sociological Association's Quadrennial Award for Excellence in Research and Practice. Her most recent book is Research, Politics and Social Change. Other books include The Good University, the one that we'll be discussing today, Southern Theory, Masculinities, Gender Power, Ruling Class, Ruling Culture, and Making the Difference. Her work has been translated into 24 languages, and Professor Connell has been active in the labor movement and in work for gender equality and peace. We also have Professor Matri Chaudhary with us, who is a retired professor of sociology at the Center for the Study of Social Systems, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She is one of the founders of Doing sociology. I welcome both of them to this discussion and what we are going to do is first begin with the conversation with Professor Connell and then have some observations and comments from Professor Chaudhary. Welcome Professor Connell, thank you so much for giving your time to doing sociology. I'm very happy to do that. Right, so since we're going to talk about uh, the book The Good University, let me begin by asking you what prompted you to write this book? And you mentioned that the dispute at the University of Sydney uh, is one of the reasons in your introduction. So if you could elaborate on the specific context as well as the larger context of transformation that made you you know, interested in universities. Sure, uh, as you say, it was a, a specific struggle, if you like, at the university that uh, put me in, uh, made, that made me think about the situation in universities generally and and therefore eventually wound up with the uh, the writing of, of the book. Um, that particular moment was, was quite an interesting and illuminating one. It was about 10 years ago now. Um, there was a time when uh, Australian universities generally had been changing quite quickly uh, with the rise of, of corporate style management, um, a shift from public funding to fee based funding, um, where all Australian universities previously had been public universities and free uh, to go for students to go to more and more they became dependent on fees. And in that context, there was, uh, in the, the way the university ran, uh, the way it was managed had been changing. Um, and the people who, who controlled the university began to look more and more like corporate managers running a company that was trying to make profits. Um, <clears throat> So more and more of the staff were made what we call casual, that is precarious workers. Um, more and more uh, was charged to the students. So fees rose very, very significantly. Um, and at this particular moment, back in, in 2013 at, at my university, we had been experiencing what seemed to be particularly aggressive management um, towards the workers in the university. Um, so uh, uh, um, arbitrary restructuring, uh, denial of rights to, to some of the staff. Um, there was growing distrust, I think, of the managers by the both the academic and the non-academic staff. And eventually, um, since wages and conditions in Australian universities, which used to be fixed nationally under the, the neoliberal uh, policy regime that we now have, just as, as India does, um, that was now dependent on 
bargains, wage bargains were struck between the union and the management of each individual university. It's called enterprise bargaining in Australia. And the enterprise bargaining time came around and the union made some proposals about what wages and conditions should be in the new uh, triennium in the next three years. The management for a long time refused to negotiate at all, which meant that nothing changed. Uh, and then came up with proposals of their own after some months uh, of, of discussion, um, which actually represented a, a significant deterioration in the conditions of employment and a real wage cut uh, over the life of the agreement. Um, and this horrified the union representatives, it, of course, disturbed quite a lot of the staff and when the management refused to negotiate as we saw it in good faith um, we took a ballot of the union members which uh, we are required to do by Australian law there was a large majority uh, supporting going on strike so we did and uh, we went on strike initially for one day and then for, I think it was two days or maybe three the next time after going back for bargaining and so on. The struggle lasted for most of a year um, and eventually produced a result we deal better than what management had proposed at the start, though not quite as good as the union had intended at, at the start. And uh, that was the longest industrial dispute that had ever happened in an Australian university. And certainly the angriest, um, because, you know, very many of the staff were very disturbed about the way our managers were behaving. And um, eventually it became other universities around the country, the same kind of thing were happening. Um, and so both what was happening in, in, that, in our university and what was happening nationally and then, of course, internationally too, um, made me think, you know, it's time to do some really hard thinking about what universities are, how the, the, the economy of knowledge works, um, what managerialism in universities is, is all about. And, and what kind of futures could we have? Um, and what alternatives uh, there might be? So th those are the things I try to talk about in the book. And it took some years of thinking and further industrial disputes uh, to um, uh, before I could finally crystallize it all. Uh, it took several years, which is normal, I guess, for writing a book. Um, and uh, then it came out. So I'm, I'm, uh, it, it certainly came out of a specific experience, but it then tried to speak to what was going on in, in the wider world. Thank you for so beautifully laying out the context. Uh, we were also struck by the way you address the fundamental question of what is a university. And you remark that universities, as we understand them for a good part of the 20th century, are actually of very recent origin. So the matter of being places which conduct both research and teaching, for instance, what then is a university? Do you think that it should have some core features? Yeah, there's a lot of myth making about universities, I guess. Um, like when we put on our academic robes for a graduation, we're dressing up to look a little bit like what clerics and scholars looked like in the European Middle Ages 500 years ago. Not exactly the same, of course. Um, but uh, the, the, the myth making has a point. Uh, there is a long history, uh, that, uh, not only in Europe, I might say, but, but also in the Islamic world, in South Asia, uh, in East Asia, uh, of uh, you know, institutions that, that served the purpose of higher learning. Um, 
Um, and, and it's good to know that, that we have, you know, multiple traditions. Uh, and yet it's very difficult to pin down, you know, what you might call core features uh, apart from, I guess, two things are, you know, if you don't have these, then you don't have a, a university. One is that uh, you've got an institution that sits at the top level of an education of a, an education system, whether that involves schools, madrasas, or, or whatever. Um, and there's a workforce that that, if you like, uh, is the 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 key uh, bearer of of knowledge and expertise within that larger education system. So there's always a context. You don't have universities sitting in, in outer space with no context in, a, in an education uh, system. And the second thing it, it really, I mean, it's very closely related to that, but the university is an institution for the, the production and consolidation of knowledge. And that hasn't always been the main idea. So in, in other periods of history, for instance, universities were mainly understood as places where existing knowledge was taught, uh, disseminated, uh, accumulated perhaps, but not new knowledge being produced. Um, so, for instance, in, in the, the so-called scientific revolution in, in early modern Europe, uh, much of the new physics, uh, the new chemistry uh, was produced outside of universities, actually. Um, and uh, the same you know, might, might be true of other knowledge systems, too. Um, so some knowledge institutions then are about con consolidating or celebrating and, and teaching uh, what is understood to be traditional knowledge in a given culture. Um, but contemporary universities are generally thought of as a place where new knowledge is produced and circulated. Uh, so although there are certainly traditions around which we appeal to with the academic dress and the, the ceremonies, um, the production of new knowledge is, has in fact become extremely important in the, if you like, the rationale um, of university systems, especially I might say public university systems. So if you look at private universities globally, although there are some elite research universities that are private universities, like Harvard, for instance, most private universities in the world are essentially teaching, teaching colleges and are, are not producing significant, significantly producing new knowledge. Uh, but most public universities do. Um, so the model of, of an institution that combines teaching and research is almost a definition of what public universities are supposed to be today. Right. You also mentioned that we cannot understand research or teaching without looking at them as forms of work. So how does one understand teaching and learning as labor? Well, uh, here, it, I mean, it's relevant that I'm a sociologist. <laughs> um, and, and I have done quite a lot of field work uh, in institutions, um, and I'm very familiar with the field of industrial sociology. Um, so when I see work uh, in, happening in an institution, I can recognize it, and it becomes important uh, for understanding the institution. Um, so, you know, when you have work, you have a workforce, and, and that is a really important part of understanding universities to think about their workforce. Although a lot of debates about universities go on without any recognition of a workforce, especially the non-academic workforce, who constitute about half, you know, about 
both the workforce of, of a public university, uh, you know, the professional workers, the maintenance workers, repair workers, the ground staff, um, security staff, the computer staff, and so on and so forth, they're essential to the way um, research and, and teaching happen in, in universities. So there's a workforce that's a really important you know, theme in the sociology of, of labour, industrial sociology. When, you, when you're thinking about work itself, um, you know, a familiar definition of work is that it's a, a activity, social activity, that involves the transformation of some object into another state, which is useful for human purposes, for social purposes in some way. So that object, you know, can be metal. So you have the work of miners and smelters and metal fabricators and so forth. So it can also be uh, the object of knowledge can be immaterial, like the state of knowledge or the capacities of, of young people. Um, so that the labour of teaching is very much concerned with the transformation of young people's capacities to act, um, whether that's, you know, intellectual reasoning or whether it's social behaviour or something like that. Nevertheless, education involves the transformation of, of their, their capacities. So those are key features of any labour process, if you like, and you see it in universities all around you. I mean, there's work going on all the time in the place and now of course some of the work is is uh, offloaded is off-site because uh, it's online and you can do some of it at home not all of it but some of it um, other features that are familiar to industrial sociologists uh, that you can see in university there's a flow of resources of course of funds of uh, material resources um, I can recognize labor in my own practice uh, as an academic, um, as a teacher and as a researcher. I recognize that my, my work takes time, uh, it takes sweat, um, it, it makes me tired, uh, I need to regenerate, and of course I'm paid a wage for it. So, you know, there's a lot here that's very familiar in industrial solid, uh, sociology and makes industrial sociology like, quite an important tool for, for understanding universities and understanding uh, by, by virtue of uh, understanding um, teaching and, and research as forms of work. Um, and, and it also is important in thinking about managerialism or corporatization because one of the, the is that it changes the labour process. It reorganises the labour process and also attempts to, to reorganise the labour force. Um, and some of the ham-fisted, you know, badly planned attempts to do that were in fact what provoked the strike at, at the University of Sydney. And, and more of that today. Uh, so one of the big scandals in in Australian universities at the moment um, is the amount of wage theft that's going on. That is, uh, workers, members of staff uh, who've done work and not been paid for it as they should have been under the law. Um, and um, the, the, the union calculates, I think, that something like nearly $200 million uh, of, of stolen wages in the Australian university system at the moment. And that may be an underestimate, in fact, because it's often quite difficult to document how, how much, uh, even when you know that it's happened. So in all sorts of ways then, it's, it's really illuminating and important um, to think about, uh, about the work that is involved in, in universities. And that's where sociology provides really important tools uh, for understanding universities.
uh, right and uh, maybe it's connected to you know the next question itself about uh, the agenda of a good university which implies that there should be some democratic change but when we are caught between neoliberal policies and also authoritarian regimes how is that possible or is it possible yes um uh, that yeah, i mean you you there summarized the great you know strategic dilemma for uh university war reform um, in, in, in the world today. So in Australia, we don't have as authoritarian a government as the one that has been uh, building up power in India, um, but we certainly have a, 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 a neoliberal market-friendly political system uh, which sees universities, understands universities basically as competitive firms and has given a, you know, a, a, a lot of support to the, the, uh, the corporatization, the transformation of universities into to corporate style institutions. Um, and I realize a good deal of that too has, has happened in, in India as it has in other parts of the world. So in some countries of South America, for instance, Brazil uh, and Chile, I think would be the uh, extreme cases, um, something like 80% of undergraduate enrollments so are now in private universities. Um, well, uh, you know, India has gone some way down that track, but it's not reached quite that level uh, as yet. So, uh, we're 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 up against very serious institutional resistance to to any de demo democratic reform uh, in universities, um, and and in a way, we have to do what we can, um, not expecting massive transformations in the short term because we won't, can't we really can't won't get that, uh, and yet we have to try. Um, because the students and the people who use the knowledge that comes out of universities, the people whose, whose lives in one way or another are affected uh, by what happens in, in universities, really do depend on us to make these good or better institutions and, and not uh, pure profit-making, extractive industries. Um, so what do we do? Well, I think you know, when we confront an authoritarian political regime or a neoliberal uh, economic regime, uh, we look for their limits um, uh, because they, they never have total control, they never have total power. We look for their incoherencies and contradictions because often they do have incoherencies um, that can be identified and pushed at. And, and there are gaps, so to speak, in their coverage. Um, they, they also have, if you like, utopias, bad utopias, I think, which they do not achieve completely. Um, so there are possibilities for alternatives, even in the belly of the monster. Uh, we can have liberated zones. We we can have you know compromise formations to to speak for a moment uh, in in the language of psychoanalysis. Um, there are partial achievements, partial gains, um, and and in looking for those, we in, in in moving into those possibilities, we may open up larger prospects. In, in in the longer term, so there there are always pathways um, in, in, into a future. I think it's quite crucial in, in thinking about that um, that we think also about acting collectively, uh, not thinking of this as an individual problem. I mean, it, it impinges on us as individuals certainly. I mean, th these institutions can be oppressive. Um, can be damaging, um, and I think that does. I, I've known, you know, friends and colleagues who have simply burnt out 
under the pressure of, of you know, contesting intrusive and uh, management and 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 poor conditions of, of employment. Um, but to to change those, we we do have to act collectively. Um, we have to to mobilise. Uh, unions are a crucial uh, form of defence, and also it's crucial for them to have agendas of, of change for the future. So thinking utopian in utopian ways. Professional associations also, I think, matter uh, because one of the features of managerialism really is that it obliterates professional knowledge um, in, in favour of, of um, you know, management by objectives, quantification and, and um, all of the, the things that you can now do with, with artificial intelligence and online surveillance systems. Um, so professional associations are one of the ways of resisting that, uh, of defending uh, real knowledge and, and serious research. Um, and there are other forms of collective action too. There are social movements which have an interest in the knowledge that come out of universities. The environmental movement, for instance, has major interest in, in the knowledge produced by universities since the whole of climate science basically comes out of universities and research institutes that are staffed from universities. But then social movements, other kinds of social movements too. Um, workers' movements have an interest in, in education. Dalit movements, I know, have been struggling around access to higher education in, in India. Um, indigenous movements in Australia have had a long struggle for access to the university system too. So there are other social movements too, which have a stake um, in universities and universities operating as democratic and inclusive institutions too. Uh, stop me uh, when I start raving. <laughs> I do, I do feel fairly strongly about this, and, no, yeah, and it's fascinating. Um, um, I, I, I think it's important that, that the connection, the possible connections of universities with wider social movements, uh, are, are recognised. Uh, our, our struggles in universities are we are not alone on on these issues. Yeah, I think uh, the point you mentioned about not being alone and Professor Chaudhry will uh, later, of course, talk about it, that there's a lot of resonance in India as well. And uh, you talk about illumination, but also about routine. So we've been talking about this managerial model. How do you see it take over our lives and institutions of higher education? Um, well, it, it has involved the state. So governments, by and large, have 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 set up the conditions for the managerial revolution, so to speak, in universities, um, with policies that introduce fee funding, uh, policies um, that introduce forms of surveillance and accountability which required corporate style management, um, policies that treated universities as if they were competitive firms competing against each other in a market. Um, and then, of course, uh, laws um, which enabled the creation of private universities, which I think you know, almost is a contradiction in terms, uh, but uh, nevertheless, there they are, and, and um, very powerful institutions now. Um, so the state is part of the picture here. It's not just the managers, but the managers, of course, are the group who have benefited from this set of policies and have, uh, I mean, one only has to look at the, the salary gap uh, between uh, elite managers, vice chancellors, presidents of universities, uh, rectors of universities, and the names differ, of course, in different parts of the world, but they're really the same thing. Um, and the elite um, 
top managers now have salaries that can be 10 times uh, the salaries of rank and file academics or, um, or non-academic staff who usually have a lower average income than, than the academics. Um, so the, the income inequality, the wage inequality in universities has increased quite dramatically uh, over the last 30 or 40 years. I mean, it, it really has changed the, the scene so that the, um, you know, top managers in, in public universities in, in Australia now um, are paid a uh, million dollars a year or a or million and a half dollars a year. Um, whereas, um, you know, rank and file tutors and uh, especially part-time insecure um, uh, low-level academic staff, uh, you know, are scraping to find um, to find the rent. Um, so that's that's an important part of it. We shouldn't forget that that you know material change. But as well as that, the um, managerialism depend you know institutionalizes distrust of the workforce because it's based on the experience of for-profit managers, profit managers in for-profit corporations. Uh, where you are literally exploit extracting you know income from from the workers. So there's generally a pressure, a downward pressure on wages under managerialism. There's surveillance of the workforce. The workforce is not trusted to get on with the job, um, <clears throat> but have to prove their compliance to the rules and the, the goals that are set by management, not by themselves. Uh, a lot of that now is quantified and a lot of it is online. Um, and that that regime of surveillance and, and distrust uh, really, uh, you know, undermines um, the, the cooperation among university workforce on which universities have, have traditionally depended. Um, so, you know, when we talk about, you know, academic culture or professional culture or something like that, we are talking about a history of self-management and, and, and mutual connection in a workforce, which has been the principal way that, that universities have worked in the past. Um, and... Uh, it, it seems to me that there is something quite democratic in a way about the way universities have worked, uh, which is now being eroded by managerial surveillance, uh, managerial goal setting, and of course the endless restructures that uh, universities are now subjected to by corporate style management. Uh, in the interests of lowering wage costs, but also, uh, I think, in the interests of disturbing the possibilities of cooperation and mutual knowledge among workers in, in universities. So the, the kind of busyness uh, of university workers has increased. We are required to fill in forms all the time, to report on ourselves. Uh, to to answer an avalanche of emails or reporting requirements. And in a way, as the busyness of uh, university work has, has increased, the intellectual ambition has decreased. And you don't have, you know, path-breaking ideas uh, that, that have the capacity to transform a field or, uh, or, or, or open a new frontier in, 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 in knowledge. If you're busy filling in forms or grading um, on, on a template, uh, hundreds and, and hundreds of students work. Um, 
So there's some there's a sh there's shift in the in the labor process that has been imposed. I me is in the long term um, destructive of the intellectual ambitions and capacities of universities. Uh, I've, I've watched, for instance, the PhD as a degree in Australia change from what was a very difficult but also exciting uh, and very largely self-directed large-scale research exercise with a lot of mentoring uh, built in. Um, that has changed to a much more routinized and much less ambitious uh, kind of project, uh, heavily scrutinized uh, now uh, in a way so that the uh, the reporting requirements have, have, in fact, you know, a whole apparatus of reporting and surveillance has been uh, has been imposed, both to reduce the cost of teaching the PhD um, and to make the whole thing more predictable, if you like, as a labour process. So students are now moved in, in, in Australia, the, I think it, it's still the case, it certainly was at the time I ret required, retired, that after three and a half years, the funding cut out. Student couldn't get any further government funding for the project. The university didn't recognize any labor that you put in as part of your job. So everyone had to be marched through the PhD in a fixed period of time under you know, the, the surveillance of, of relevant committees and so forth, and then it was over. Um, okay, um, you know, that's... Um, there, there are other... I mean, people can, I think, legitimately talk about a kind of alienation. It's not... Unknown in universities that, you know, if you look at research on the student experience from a generation or two ago, you will find alienation, you will find um, unhappiness um, um, in, in different conditions. So I don't think, I don't want to pretend ever that there's been a golden age of, of universities. Um, but I do think we've, if you like, institutionalized um, a, a system of, of control, uh, surveillance, a form of the labor processes that um, really hinder um, imagination, uh, real innovation, uh, while of course pretending. Um, to, to recognize what's now called innovation. Uh, speaking of innovation as well, uh, broadcasting to the public has also become essential to modern research. So uh, do you think it's a straightforward process? Well, uh, I, I understand broadcasting in a, in a somewhat large uh, way as including all forms of of the, the dissemination of research. So that would include certainly publication in professional journals, in research journals. Uh, it would include, uh, to me, um, also uh, taking the findings of research to professional groups who make use of it in their work. I've done a fair bit of research in, in the field of education. I've always thought that teachers in schools were an important part of the audience for my research, and therefore I've, I've worked to make research available. Not my own, only my own research, of course, but including that, um, to audiences of, of, of teachers. And I encourage all academics to do that kind of work. Um, 
the logic of, of dissemination in, in a way is straightforward, but the, the details are, are always complicated um, because, you know, whatever media you use, uh, media means mediating and mediating institutions, uh, and they can have their own interests and biases built in. Um, and, of course, they are also subject to commodification. And uh, you know, the classic example of that is publishing your work in academic journals, okay? Uh, so, you know, you, you want to publish, ideally, your research in, in as a sociologist, you want to publish in, in well-known sociological journals. Um, but now, of course, many of those are actually owned uh, by corporations, um, which earn, uh, make a lot of money out of them uh, by charging for access. So there are paywalls in front of most of the well-known sociology journals. And when a certain amount of uh, anger was raised by this, it was pointed out that this made, uh, you know, um, the, the, the best known journals accessible only to audiences in the global north and priced completely out of the range of audiences in the global south. Well, the corporations are looking again to the bottom line, introduced um, a regime of open access publication where the academic had to pay. You still had to pay. For it, but someone else in this case paid the academic or the academic's own institution or the research funder was required to pay, but the, the publishers themselves still made money out of it. So it's been a you know a terrible shift there. And this is a very highly concentrated industry. So about five, five or six publishers, you know, publish about half the, um, you know, the, the well-known journals in all disciplines um, in, in, in the world. Um, there's a, you know, massive flux there which uh, restrict in, in, in various ways access to knowledge or the dissemination of knowledge. Um, and then uh, our, our circulation of our research, if we want to influence policies on important matters, and we've done research um, that, that speaks to some you know, important issue of public policy, uh, whether it's um, you know, the, uh, social inequality in uh, access to higher education, in, in education outcomes, it's a common topic in, in the sociology of education, or perhaps it's, if, if you're a climate scientist, you're doing research that's relevant to climate change, or if you're a biologist, you're doing research that's relevant to the impact of climate change, like maybe a change in the distribution of a certain species of ant or a certain species of plant, which may be important for agricultural production. Uh, then you've got to look out of your shoulder all the time to, you know, the corporations whose interests you may be in, you may be disrupting by publishing your research. You may find that you're under attack um, from uh, corporate-funded scientists or pseudo-scientists who accuse you of falsifying your findings or falsifying your data or conspiring to mislead the public. Uh, my research on one occasion was attacked by a parliamentary committee of right-wing politicians in, in, in Australia uh, without very much effect, luckily, but uh, in other fields, that kind of attack can be very, very damaging and disruptive. Um, think about research and, and, and uh, you know, research on gender is now coming under fire um, in, in a number of parts of, of the world, um, perhaps less in India than it has been in, in the United States or some parts of Europe. But in some parts of Europe now, um, 
gender research is now banned from universities. Um, and um, that that is uh, coming, I think, in the United States. Uh, certainly, gender researchers have been attacked by right-wing politicians in, in Australia too and in some parts of Latin America. So um, there, there are, um, you know, the, the, the process of broadcasting, of, of making knowledge widely available is really tremendously important. It's lifeblood for, you know, the, the, the research-based knowledge formation. We must have it, uh, and yet it makes us vulnerable, and it is constrained and shaped in various ways that uh, are, are socially regressive um, or, or, or damaging. And, and we, and there's no simple solution to any of that, but we just have to to recognise that these things happen, and, and you know, be prepared to do what we can. Um, to, to make sure knowledge, sound knowledge, actually does circulate. What do you mean uh, when you state that leak tables for universities essentially reproduce existing privileges? Because if we are talking about uh, broadcasting research as well as uh, for a public good, so is there any connection between you know a reproduction of privileges and then a public good? Yes, um, it's it's all very much interconnected, I, I think, uh, and connected in, in ways that are somewhat difficult to, to unravel. So think, for instance, you know, when you look at the, the league tables, as they're informally called, uh, that is the lists of universities ranked in some order of, of merit according to some uh, criteria that the, the commercial entity that creates the, the league table um, has chosen to use. I don't trust these league tables as measures of academic quality, but they do have, uh, uh, that's what they purport to be, and they're very widely believed to, to measure um, the quality of, of universities or particular uh, departments or, or schools. Um, and when you look into them, I mean, they're very largely a proxy for the, the wealth, for the resources that uh, different universities or different university systems have. Uh, so who's at the top of the, the, the league tables generally? You know, depending a little, uh, shifting a little from year to year, but you will find generally at the top, Harvard, Columbia, Chicago, Stanford, the elite private universities in the United States, some elite um, public institutions that have very similar academic profile, Michigan, uh, for instance, Oxbridge, although they're practically privatised now, too. Humboldt, University of Berlin, um, and so on. Um, okay, these are, you know, from the wealthiest countries and the wealthiest higher education systems in the world. And, you know, you, you will find if you... Let's take the, the case of of sociology, for instance, the discipline we know and love. Um, you know, if you wanted to, you know, publish in the top sociology journals uh, to get your work most widely known, you've done some terrific research on whatever subject it is, you want to publish it in the top journal, um, and you want this to be known internationally, where do you go? Well, you don't publish it in Australia, and I don't think you would um, publish it in many journals in India, too, if you wanted this kind of profile. You would go to the United States, because according to the league tables, of the top 20 sociology journals in the, in the world, 19 of them are published in the United States. And if you ask who are the editors of these journals, who are the people who make the editorial decisions about what, what research should get published and what should not? Almost all of them 
come from about 20 or 30 or maybe 40 of the sociology departments in those elite universities in the United States, plus a few from Europe, continental, continental Europe, a few more from Britain because that's English-speaking country, um, maybe one or two from Australia, but the great bulk of them are from the United States and they are from these elite universities. That's where we will go to get published if we want our work to circulate most widely. <clears throat> um, so that's why I say that the league tables, such as for journals as well as for universities and departments, largely reproduce the privileges which are to a significant extent you know, economic privileges, but also the accumulated you know, institutional authority uh, within university systems. And um, you know, that, that has been the situation for a long time and it, it is not showing very much sign of change. And the open access movement hasn't changed it much. Uh, although it's given a certain authority to the over to certain corporations, really, um, alongside uh, universities, um, I I mean I I hate to say this, but but I, I do argue in the good university when I'm thinking about the the way university systems. Um, you know, reproduce social inequalities or, or and produce social inequalities. Um, that, that one of the things universities now do is model um, inequality. You know, 100, 150 years ago, um, we might have thought aristocracies, you know, model and uh, um, in the, the prestige of, of aristocracies provided an important social model uh, for for social hierarchy. You know the, the the upper castes, the aristocratic families, uh, the the plutocracies, uh, the landed uh, gentry of, of Europe. Uh, the plutocracies in the settler colonies, those kinds of groups provided social models. Uh, and that was a, a situation of, of social hegemony for established power, against which democratic movements fought very long and very hard and still do. Um, but universities now are one of the institutions which model inequality for the world, um, university systems as a whole provide now this stunning display of hierarchy from the Harvards and the the, the, um, uh, you know, the, the Chicago's at the top, uh, all the way down to your neighborhood college in in rural Victoria or rural New South Wales. Um, and it's a highly visible system of uh, which is believed in. I mean, it is it is a pattern of hegemony uh, for the society as a whole. There is this immense range of excellences from from the top to bottom, and I ha I really hate that. Um, I, I think that's it's really sad. Um, and it, it is something that we can struggle against, um, partly by contesting the language of inequality, um, by, by emphasizing the quality, the excellence that is actually found in your neighborhood rural college, where there may be good teaching, there may be good research, uh, although there is very little in the way of resources. Um, and, and that kind of work should be celebrated. 
in groups who can circulate that kind of, of, of knowledge. You know, we've been having a very engaging conversation and I have one last yet longish question. So in 2014, there was a list of attributes that you drew out, which you felt that ought to be in a list for good universities. For instance, being educationally confident, socially inclusive, a good place to work, democratic as an organization, having multiple epistemologies, a modest in its demeanor and intellectually ambitious. Now, you mentioned that there are limits to this list, but of course that the exercise is genuinely useful, especially at a time when neoliberal universities are steadily shutting down and their internal forums, you know, are required for debate. So I would want to probably end our conversation with this question of what is the possibility of a university then? Mm. Well, the possibility of the university is... is... It's always present in in our work, uh, I guess. The, the constraints of, of authoritarian states and corporate style management and market logics and so forth. In, in the work of universities, it seems to me there are always democratic possibilities. Uh, there are inclusive uh, ways of of teaching, uh, there are cooperative ways of doing university work, uh, and there is a history of this too. I mean, we um, uh, one of the really unfortunate features of the the neoliberal world, I guess, is that it tends to to obliterate history to to act as if things have always been thus, and that there's, there's never anything very different and there has been um there have been democratic movements in universities before there have been anti-colonial colleges and, and universities um there have been indigenous universities there are indigenous universities and, and colleges in latin america and south asia uh, there have been experimental colleges there have been socialist colleges labor colleges. Um, there, there's a, a rich history of, of alternatives, uh, different coming out of different kinds of democratic struggle uh, that we really ought to know about. I have a chapter on, on this in the book, um, and, and it's really only you know, scraping the surface. Um, and it's worth, you know, exploring and, and investigating those uh, those histories, if only to to be encouraged, um, because you know universities in the in the past have long been, you know, oligarchic institutions. You know, when I was a student, we used to talk about the god professor who controlled the university. Um, and we struggled against the God professors. Uh, we we had student movements that invented. We invented our own. We created what we called a free university down the street, um, and ran our own courses without any professors. Uh, and students can do that today too, uh, if they're of course not burdened down with having to manage three jobs, in order, three part-time jobs in order to pay the fees. Um, so, you know, situations change, but, but the possibilities um, are always there. And, and that's why I think that some degree of utopian thinking is always a good thing. I mean, we have to be severely realistic, true, but we also have to have an imagination that we have to be able to to say you know, always, you know, things can be different, things might be different. And here are some other possibilities. So they might be 10 years in the future, they might be 50 years in the future, might be 200 years in the future. But there are possibilities there. Um, and a, an element of utopian thinking, I think, is, is can be a great encouragement. Um, to, to invention and, and cooperation. So I'm all in favour of a bit of utopia. Uh, 
uh, as well as a lot of, of realism uh, for, for the struggle. Thank you so much, Professor Connell. I think it's great that you end on a positive and a utopian note. I would now invite Professor Chaudhary to give her comments and observations. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Connell. This was absolutely extraordinary. And as I was listening to you, I was struck by uh, that there are very similar processes which have taken place in India, uh, but there are also significant differences. And I think one of the significant differences for my generation uh, is that uh, we were not prepared for the changes. Uh, you know, it was sudden uh, and uh, we were grappling with the changes even as they took place. So in the 90s, when you had uh, the new economic reforms or liberalization, or the main question that arose was privatization. So it was privatization of universities, as well as privatization of a lot of the public sectors, uh, which were instituted after 1947 with independence. And we were not fully aware, we thought about privatization in a more limited sense, that what would happen then is uh, that the wage structure would be changed, uh, that we would not have the social security that was associated with a government job. Because in India, where we did not have that kind of enterprising private sector for many decades after 1947, uh, we were not used uh, to the idea of the precarity of government jobs and government jobs were limited. So even within the trade union movement of uh, university teachers, college teachers, and there was a vibrant movement, uh, it was restricted to what we call, could call in retrospect uh, a set of economic demands, you know, uh, that was said that, you know, raise our wages, uh, our provident funds, or that kind of thing. But the idea that the university space, which we took for granted as a free space, we did not quite realize that this free space or autonomous space would also be vanquished under the new regime. Uh, so it was a very restricted understanding that we had. I was also very struck uh, by your uh, term of that everybody then became in the current context of university education very busy. And I still remember there was this very long uh, strike in the late 1980s uh, by the university college teachers. And there was a campaign by the media into the 90s which said, these people anyway do not do any work coming back to your emphasis on work. What do they have to do? They are idle. Uh, they go take a class if they feel like, they don't take a class if they don't feel like. So there was a public discourse against higher education, in particular, the social sciences and humanities. Because like in the question of the natural sciences, they felt they did something. They invented new gadgets, they did some dramatic discoveries. What did these people do? And I think we failed to have a discussion about the role of social sciences and humanities uh, across, you know. So that is the other second uh, difference that we uh, find. So we did not have an academic discussion apart from the economics of private education. So what changed? We were not prepared for that. We took many of the provisions of the state for granted. It was not perhaps an ideal democratic state, but it was a state for very long, which was extremely uh, generous to public good, education as a public good. Uh, and uh, since I was a product of say, Dwala Nehru University, uh, this was very deep rooted. The idea that we have to do something, in fact, in the JNU Act, uh, which came about in uh, the 1969, the Parliament Act, they actually talk about reaching out to the public. It should not be an ivory tower. Uh, we must bring in the uh, knowledge produced by the marginalized communities. And many of that took place, but we were also marred by an 
a failure to engage with the umpteen number of private colleges, public institutions across the country. There was a certain kind of insulation by certain universities from what was happening in other places. So many of our public universities, which were extraordinary, many of our leading uh, political, academic, literary leaders, say from Allahabad universities, Banaras Hindi universities, Lucknow universities, they sort of, they were not destroyed or diminished by neoliberalism per se, or by authoritarian regimes as they were by neglect and by a culture of patron clientship. When again, you give a job to somebody was more important than producing knowledge. And producing knowledge itself was seen as an elite enterprise. And in the contemporary populist regime, it fits in. Oh, these people are elite people. Why are they elite? Because they're producing knowledge. So we are today in a culture which I would say is routine, dull. Uh, in fact, contrary to everything that you mentioned when you say, what should a good university be? So it is educationally not confident. It is educationally unsure about itself. So we brag a lot. Either we have out migration to the global universities across, as you would be well aware, we have a lot of Indian academics globally known who are actually trained in our public universities and who are now there in private universities abroad. We are educationally extremely, we lack extreme confidence today in our own parts. So we want to brag. We want to brag about the greatness of the golden past, about our ancient knowledge, without any real good understanding of those knowledge systems. We want to bring in Sanskrit everywhere without engaging with Sanskrit as a serious classical knowledge. So we want to sort of just reduce it. So the attack is more uh, from the inside, emptying out the knowledge categories, emptying out university spaces. Socially inclusive, again, emptied out. So you said, yes, we should have people from all communities. We should have affirmative action or what we call reservation, but emptied out by a different kind of elitism where you say, look, they will not understand high knowledge. So we must water down, we must dilute, we must have one line answers, which fits in with a culture of rote education or the banking system of education, which has a very strong presence in the contemporary. So we have now have, uh, instead say in universities, we would have our own uh, enrollment structure, our own interview uh, system, our own entrance examination. We now have a standardized multiple, uh, what is it called, uh, Rituparna, I keep forgetting. the Multiple choice. Yes. Is, uh, multiple, yeah. So, you know, how tall is Kutub Minar or how many people are there or how, how big is the a particular building, or I think uh, we had an example of how long was uh, the national educational uh, planning, how many pages does it constitute? Now, when you have that, you have a kind of dulling down, a routinization, and obviously a lack of confidence, because that's all you've learned of social sciences. Good places to work, we are, I'm sorry to say, I mean, the younger people are suffering, I'm retired, uh, that uh, they are very, very repressive places to work, continuous surveillance, continuous monitoring, and empty, um, you know, flagging out our achievements because we have to top in those indexes, uh, you know, so uh, how well you have. But it doesn't have any of the content of even an index category. Democratic as organizations, and I want to just make a point here, that what is the role of social sciences? The neoliberal regime sees us as producing knowledge, which can be instant and applicable. So gender uh, courses are not being attacked here, but what we have is, uh, can you solve uh, gender discrimination? 
uh, in one or two mechanisms. So our role is that we must suggest two or three principles by which can be done, but the larger process can be very deeply patriarchal and authoritarian. So in fact, we have uh, more courses on gender empowerment, gender sensitization, but emptied of its you know, serious, scholastic, radical import. You know, these are just sort of like instant uh, modules that you have to produce. And epistemologically multiple, no, we are not epistemologically multiple at all, uh, because what is being asked is that we must see uh, the universities or academics as what I would see as cheerleader. What is our role to the state? So our role to the state would be seen as we must propagate the good that the state does. And if you say anything else, it would be negative because we have not, it is our fault, we have not cultivated decades of critical knowledge where we see critique as a public good. And critique not as something which is negative or maybe even worse as is uh, spread out in the public discourse as nagging. Like you are never very happy with what you do, you are nagging. So that we don't even have the distinction between critique and being just plain unpleasant or being negative. Uh, modest in demeanor, I'm sorry to say, today we are, we just have people who brag. And that's where we, uh, we were a little uncomfortable with the broadcasting. You talked about managerialism, but along with managerialism, we have what is called the publicity industry. The publicity industry, whether it's for political leaders or, or whether it is for what we do. So how many times have we been tweeted? Uh, how many people have actually, uh, you know, reproduced what you've done? Citation in the public realm without really going into it in any depth. So all of us, we're still grappling with some of these changes. Uh, Rituparna, who's worked in a public uh, college, and she's uh, she would be familiar, she no longer has that job now, is the question that uh, people, all my students, in fact, say, we have to constantly write down the point that you mentioned, fill up forms. How many seminars have you held? Who have you called? Uh, how many presentations have your students done? Uh, you know, it's a constant counting. And actually, we've heard from other parts of the country where we said, look, you don't have to bother too much on teaching, even in schools, but please tell us what you are doing. So this has transformed even the possibility that we does. Intellectually ambitious has become, again, ambitious in the public domain. Not that, because I felt that anonymity did us a lot of good as academics, away from public gaze, even as you're engaged publicly. But if you're in constant pressure to be productive and to be recognized, it can erode your spirits. And you would be tempted to do something instant, that instant knowledge, instant publicity. So I, I still retain your optimism. I think it's a great idea to be utopian. Uh, we have been a colonized country and people actually produced during that colonial regime, uh, you know, under very, very severe kind of stress. I think we could do it, but we have to reimagine because our university structures, even before our eyes have been completely reconstituted. Even as I speak, it's been reconstituted every day with no murmur in public discourse. So this is a sad point that I do, uh, talking about professional associations. Uh, even there, uh, we have the same strands, the same trends coming about, you know. Uh, but we may be uh, able to discuss this a uh, little later. But I would really thank you for what you've done, because we actually need intellectual help to figure out what is it that is changing in the contemporary period, you know, and very, very fast. We have no time to breathe almost, you know, because uh, it is so fast, so severe, and we do not know what's coming. Thank you again, once again, for this absolutely wonderful elaboration of your work and the reflections that you put together. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Chaudhary. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Connell, would you want to respond to some of her comments? Um, I have very little to, to add to that. Um, some of the story sounds familiar, um, even though the order of events, in a way, is, is different. Uh, we've also had, for instance, right-wing media attacking uh, public education um, as feather bedding, uh, public teachers as uh, lazy if they were not um, subversive. Um, that kind of thing has happened uh, with us too. I think there was, in, in Australia, there was a, um, a time when we could see some of this coming. It wasn't, it didn't sort of land on us just all in it of a sudden, um, but in the 1980s, there was a, uh, a quite dramatic shift, uh, especially under a Labour government, uh, towards neoliberal policy regime. Um, and that had, um, you know, sent some shockwaves through the education system. Um, new demands for accountability uh, and measurement, more directed to the schools initially, but some of the, that language also began to apply uh, to universities. And we could see the, the change of the, the economic regime um, developing. Um, but there was still a very dramatic moment when that was applied to the, the university sector uh, by a new Minister of Education um, who set up a, a, a kind of, uh, one, one couldn't call it an inquiry because it, its results were known in advance, but. Uh, set up a, pol a new policy process that produced a blueprint for a more competitive, what the minister, I'm sure, thought was more modernised university system. He did, he did sell it uh, to his, his uh, party as a, a modernisation agenda. That was how neoliberalism was sold generally. Uh, to Australia in the 1980s. Um, and, but it, it then um, landed on the universities at the end of the 1980s as a, a new set of policies and, uh, and, and legislation for what had been a completely public university system, though, and also a fairly equal one. So there was actually, there were national uh, policies that applied to all universities in the country. They were all funded at the same kind of level um, under the same, uh, from the same sort of single, single payer, that was the, the national government. Um, and suddenly they would be, the universities were being asked to compete with each other. I think that was a crucial moment a crucial shock, if you like, rather than thinking of the other universities as your colleagues, people that you wanted to cooperate with, you're asked to think of them as your rivals. Um, and you you then had to fight with them for a greater share of uh, public money or a greater share of student fees. The, the introduction of fees because it had all, it'd been a free education system at that point. Uh, the introduction of fees was act, actually, a, although it wasn't originally very big fees, but that was a crucial change, that, uh, triggering a managerial corporate mindset on the part of the people who were 
administering universities. So that that shift, and I remember um, in around in the mid nineteen nineties, um, a meeting was called of our faculty. I was working in the Faculty of Education at the time, Education and Social Work, and a meeting was called with some other uh, departments also. I think. Um, to talk to the deputy vice chancellor who was in charge of research matters. And the deputy vice chancellor came around and gave us a talk about the new funding regime that had come in that was more competitive than before and so on and so forth and how we had to maximise our own university's advantage in, in this new policy regime. And the more I heard of this, um, the more horrified I was uh, about the way it was being described. So eventually I put my hand up and said, hey, um, uh, from what you're saying, it sounds to me uh, as though we're being asked to compete with and uh, rest um, uh, you know, resources away from other universities whom we have always regarded as our colleagues and, and co cooperators. And the Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, thought about the, the question for a minute and then said, well, as far as I'm concerned about those other universities, they can drop off the twig. Uh, our job is to maximise and I'm not quoting him directly, but I am quoting him directly when I say drop off the twig, uh, which is a, an Australian idiom for, well, they can go away and die. Um, uh, what, what we were being asked to do, in fact, was to engage in a kind of you know, life and death struggle against our competitors. That was the way the policy was being set up. Um, and um, that was the moment, I think, when I began to take neoliberalism seriously, uh, to, to hear someone whom I, you know, had to respect as a, you know, well-known researcher, as someone doing a difficult administrative job uh, for the university, seem to have bought this toxic uh, attitude of, of competition at all costs um, to the running of the university. So uh, at that point, uh, you know, the scales dropped from my eyes and I began to see things as they, they really were. But in, in, in most respects, um, the, 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 the story, the, the elements of the story are very similar. I know the course of events also has been been different in Latin America, for instance, where I've had many colleagues uh, and, and have often visited, uh, where uh, actually military dictatorships were involved in some of these, these changes uh, in the setting up of a privatised university system and so forth. Um, and of course, uh, would be true uh, in, in many parts of the world, um, the United Nations Economic Institutions, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund actually vectors bringing this attitude um, to policy making, including education policy making uh, in many countries. So, yeah, it's, it's a common story. Um, it's easy to get depressed. It's easy to imagine there must have been better times in the past. Uh, and, and when people fall into that nostalgic vein, uh, then I mention my age, uh, because if my next birthday is my 80th, and I say, I was there in the past, and it wasn't all that good. We were struggling for democratic reform then too. 
uh, you just have to keep going. Um, and changes do happen. Sometimes they are changes for the good. Um, there is an ebb and flow in these things too. Uh, thank you so much for uh, responding to the comments as well and for taking us through your book and the journey. Uh, thank you, Professor Chaudhary, also for uh, listening so patiently and uh, making those succinct comments. Uh, I would like to, uh, again, thank you for uh, the conversation and the time. And uh, we will, you know, let you know once the video is uploaded. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.